Hi and welcome to a new and also very exciting video here on my channel because today we will take a closer look at the Xeon W3175X which is the unlocked 28 core Xeon which Intel showed at last year's Computex and I already had the chance last year at Computex or actually before Computex to test the CPU and also to test the first samples of the Dominus Extreme which is a very impressive motherboard. And the CPU is also very impressive in many different ways. I don't even know what a CPU costs because at the moment when I'm doing this um, video, it's early January. I don't even know what the price of the CPU is. So we will find out soon, I guess, but it's certainly the most expensive CPU I've. So I have two Dominus Extreme laying on my desk here. I have one to your left and one to your right, which is currently running the 28 core Xeon at stock only running with quad channel. So if we take a closer look at the Dominus Extreme, those are pre-production samples several months old, so don't be confused with the look. I don't have any of those um, nice looking heat sinks or also this is like early production, so don't be confused by the look. It's just a pre-production sample. And if we take a look at the socket, the socket 3647, which is typically just used in the workstation area, the board comes with six memory channels. Actually, even the old Skylake X chips, like a 7980XE, physically already contained six memory controllers, but only four were available for desktop. And now for this platform, we also have access to six memory controllers. So we have six memory channels we can use at the same time, but then we have this socket. And I couldn't hate anything more than this socket. I already hated the Thunderbird socket so much, but this is even worse. Just the fact that we don't have an ILM, so the integrated loading mechanism, with, which is typically this frame that's going over the CPU, pushing the CPU into the socket with a certain force to make sure it has proper contact to the pin, we don't have this here on socket 3647. So we have to apply pressure over the CPU block through the CPU to the socket and make sure it has proper contact. But then I don't know how many times I mounted the CPU cooler on this platform already, but I always keep losing memory slots. So I mounted, then I have three channels. I mounted again, I have five, then I mounted again, I have four. So that's why at the moment I'm just using four memory channels because it's just so damn annoying and I have no idea how Intel came up with the idea or thought it would be a good idea to have this socket for the consumer market. I understand that it might be fine for the workstation market because we have true professionals who are changing I don't know how many thousand CPUs over a year. They're used to putting the CPUs in the socket, mounting it with the heatsink. But then you have to keep in mind if you remove the CPU with the heatsink, you will also have your CPU sticking to the heatsink. And I don't know how many times I bent pins already in this socket. So yeah, good luck with this, especially when the motherboard is much more expensive than 1000 euro. That's a lot of fun. So much about this small rant for now. I just wanted to point it out because I'm only running quad channel on here, so don't get confused. Currently the system is running stock and idle, so about 2.5 gigahertz and it will boost up to 3.8. Currently in Windows it's consuming about 5 amps, so yeah, about 50 watt just idle consuming from the CPU. And we can just perform a quick Cinebench run. It's also very impressive how fast Cinebench is. So the performance is about 5,400, 5,500 points stock. That's absolutely impressive. I mean, you cannot argue with the multi-threading performance of this platform, absolutely insane. Same as the power consumption. This power consumption stock is about 220, 230 watt. And I'm cooling it with a 240 radiator with two cores of fans running at 100%, which is something you usually wouldn't do in your normal rig. So I think you could, you could compare it to a 360 radiator with low fan speed. I think it would be kind of the same performance. Also DDC pump running at almost maximum speed and I have an EK block for the CPU. So if we just run Cinebench again and take a look at the CPU temperature, we're hitting something like 65 to 70 degrees Celsius, which is totally fine. Just have to keep in mind that this is just Cinebench. If we now perform Prime95, it will be much higher. I already did some Prime95 testing for you guys, so we can compare the leading temperatures obviously afterwards. But now I will just quickly I overclocked the CPU to 4.3 and the CPU is at 4.3 at 1.15 volt. We will do more overclocking, more details, more performance comparisons in a different video, but for now just push the CPU to 4.3 at 1.15 volt. Cannot really go much higher for Prime95, that's already way too much. I think I would need at least a 480 radiator for that because it will be just on the limit for the cooling. For Cinebench, it's pretty much fine if we just um, perform a quick run. 
I mean, it's just so amazing how quick Cinevengr 15 is with this CPU at this speed. There yeah, are 6,100 points. If you keep running Cinevengr 15 at this speed, you hit something like 6.2K, 6.3K in Cinevengr 15. So, yeah, pretty incredible performance. Also, pretty incredible temperatures. So, if we keep running this, um, you can see that we hit something like 85 up to 90 degrees Celsius. I performed 10 Cinebench runs in, in a row and the temperature was minimum on the coldest core 84 degrees Celsius, maximum 95 degrees Celsius and average was 89 degrees Celsius. So that's the baseline, what we have. I also did some Prime95 numbers as I said before. And yeah, now we will delete the CPU. We will see how it goes. We made a prototype deleter for Socket 3647. Um, I'm really not sure how, if it will work out because it's the only CPU I have, also the only CPU we can try. So yeah, let's get the CPU out of the socket, put it in the Deledimate WS, that's how we call it, because it's for workstation. It also should work with the other Xeon CPUs for this socket. I never tried it, so there's only one way to find out. For the lidding, I don't really know how the CPU looks like underneath, so we will just put the CPU in this direction inside the Dilidimate, pointing with the triangle to the outside, then start tightening the Dilidimate screw. Turned out that I need quite a lot of force to delete the CPU. I think it's mainly because the surface where the CPU is glued is just so much more than compared to, let's say, an 8700K where it's quite a low surface area on the IHS, so that's why I pushed a little bit, then turned around the CPU inside the Dilidimate and pushed again from the other side until I saw that the heat spreader moved by around one millimeter and the glue started to get loose. Then turn around the CPU once more, so we are back to the starting orientation and then push again and push extremely hard. I didn't expect that we need such a high force to delete the CPU. And when I saw that the IHS was beginning to move, I pushed back the Dilidimate and removed the CPU out of the socket and removed the IHS from the PCB with my hands. And then we can see the CPU, also the inside of the heat spreader, and we can see that, as expected, Intel is using conventional thermal paste inside the unlocked 28-core Xeon, as Intel already communicated at the press event of the 9900K. Intel already said then that this CPU will not be soldered, which is fine in my eyes. And we can see how massive this chip is and also how massive the heat spreader is. Very similar to other Skylake X CPUs, we have two PCBs, so it's a stack design. We have a very thin one on the bottom, and then we have the top carrier PCB that contains the chip itself, and the chip itself is quite a lot bigger than a 7980XE. And then we have to do the usual business, so clean the IHS from the inside, remove all the thermal paste residues, start to remove all the glue residues on the IHS itself, and usually I use some sharp acrylic um, pieces I have left from our laser cutter at Case King and then clean the IHS with some acetone. Same goes for the CPU, so remove thermal paste and all the thermal paste residues first and it's quite soft, it's not dry, so that's already a good sign actually. And after I cleaned the CPU, I stole some of Mary's nail polish again, the beautiful red looking one. And then we will cover all the SMD parts with nail polish first before we start 
to remove the glue residues from the top PCB, similar to what we did on the high core count, like 7980XE Skylake X. I usually do that because you protect the SMDs anyway for liquid metal and if you protect them first with the nail polish it's a lot more unlikely that you remove some of the SMD components accidentally while removing the glue you just give them some additional stability and then we add liquid metal thermal grizzly conductor knot as usual also added on the inside of the IHS and this time I decided not to glue back the CPU just for testing purposes because I wanted to use it again a few days later for extreme overclocking results where I have to remove the liquid metal and go back to conventional paste so this time just put the IHS back on the CPU for normal testing. So we are back, I mounted the CPU again in the socket, everything is up and running, everything is alive, so I'm really happy that the CPU is still working, nothing was damaged. So we will just go over to the system. I actually just performed 20 minutes of Prime95 on this system, so everything is still a bit warm, so cannot directly compare the temperatures to our Cinebench run from before. Anyway, we will just perform a quick run. So this is again 4.3 GHz, 1.15 volt, so that's pretty much the limit for this CPU. You can see that the CPU is now hitting about 71, 85 maximum. So it's about, if I would guess for previous, it would be like five, six, seven degrees colder than before. Because mainly, as I said before, um, the system was just running for 20 minutes. So everything is nice and warm. So cannot directly compare it, but I already did the comparison runs for you. So if we just take a look at the numbers, before deleting R15, 4.3 GHz, 1.15 volt, minimum I had 84 degrees Celsius, maximum 95 degrees Celsius, average across the cores was 89.46 degrees Celsius. After deleting the coldest core or the minimum temperature was 71 degrees Celsius, which is a temperature improvement of 13 degrees Celsius. Maximum core temperature 90 degrees Celsius, so that's an improvement of 5 degrees Celsius. Average core temperature was 80.85, so that's an improvement of about 9 degrees Celsius. If we take a look at Prime95 4G 1.1 volt non-AVX Prime, I have to say, Minimum temperature before the leading was 94 degrees Celsius, so the coldest core under load. Maximum temperature was 107 degrees Celsius, so that's really quite a lot. Average was 100.8 degrees Celsius. After the leading, the minimum or the coldest core under load was 81 degrees Celsius, so that's an improvement of 13 degrees Celsius. Maximum was 102, improvement of 5 degrees Celsius. Average was 90.2. So that's an improvement of 10.6 degrees Celsius. On average, I would say we had a temperature improvement of 10 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite a lot less than I expected. Not exactly sure why this is. I only have a theory that because it's the extreme core count CPU and the die is quite a lot bigger than on the high core count or low core count CPU. This one is 21.4 times 32.2 millimeters. So it's a massive die and I think we have more surface area to dissipate the heat towards the heat spreader and also towards the CPU cooler, which should probably benefit the temperatures. So if you would ask me for advice for deleting this CPU, it really depends what you're aiming for. If you just want to put the CPU in your rig, if you want to use it for rendering professional applications without overclocking, I would not delete the CPU because it's very expensive and the risk is always there, so probably wouldn't do it. If you want to have the maximum power, if you want to run for benchmark records or whatever, if you want to have the last megahertz, of course you should do it. 10 degrees Celsius equals typically 100 to 150 megahertz benefit. So if you want to go for the last 100 megahertz, deleting is your way to go. Otherwise, I would probably not do it. At Case King, we will probably offer those CPUs deleted again with warranty. So if that's the case, you will find a link in my description. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time.